Temptation came for King David when he was least expecting it. He was simply walking on the roof of his house when he happened to see her, Bathsheba, bathing, beautiful in his sight. Temptation quickly became sin as David chose to cling to his desires rather than cling to God. In his power as king, we saw in chapter 11 that David sent and inquired about this woman. Then it says he sent messengers and took her, despite the fact that she was married. And when David learned that she was pregnant, it says he sent to Joab and said, send me Uriah the Hittite. When he couldn't get Uriah to cover up his sin, David then wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And at the end of the chapter, once he had had Uriah killed, it says David sent and brought Bathsheba to his house and made her his wife. David had the power to orchestrate all these events, but God was watching and it was evil in his sight. So now God will do some sending. He'll send someone to David to deal with him. Let's see what happens. I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1, reading from the New American Standard Version. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. We remember Nathan the prophet from 2 Samuel chapter 7. That's who David turned to when he expressed a desire to build God a house. But God sent word to Nathan to tell David, no, it's not for you to build me a house. But I will make you a house and your house and your kingdom shall endure forever. Now God sends Nathan once again with a very different word. And he, Nathan, came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children, it would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. The prophet Nathan tells David a story to drive home the heinous nature of David's actions. And when you read this story, your heart just goes out to Uriah all the more. The poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb which he bought and nourished. You just see the love and devotion that Uriah must have had for his wife Bathsheba. He didn't have several wives like David. He had one wife whom he loved and David took her. How does David respond to this story? Continuing verse five, then David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. What's interesting is that David didn't even have to think about it. He didn't say, let me ponder what the consequence should be for such behavior. He had an immediate response emotionally, his anger burned and verbally, the man deserves to die. And this is related to the taking of an animal, which was not punishable by death, but by restitution. But David does say restitution should be made fourfold. Why? Because the man showed no compassion. Continuing verse seven, Nathan then said to David, you are the man. 
Can you imagine that moment in David's heart and mind? His anger is still burning against the man in the fictional story. He's still feeling how wrong that man's actions were. And that man is David. There's nothing like the moment when God convicts. When a holy God shines a spotlight on what you've done and you can forget trying to run and hide or make excuses. David has to face what he's done and see it from God's point of view. Continuing with verse 7, thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah and if that had been too little I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. This is a stinging rebuke. You can just see God saying, I cannot believe he took this man's wife after all I did for him. And God reminds David what he's done for him. I anointed you, I delivered you, I gave you, I would have added to you. That's the part that really gets me. I would have added more things like these. My blessings are limitless, David. I own a cattle on a thousand hills. You didn't have to take what wasn't yours. Then look at the contrast. He tells David what David has done. You struck down Uriah with the sword. You did. You weren't on the battlefield, David, but you did it. You took his wife to be your wife. And again, you killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. But David's actions weren't merely toward Uriah. God says David despised the word of the Lord by doing this evil. And he says, you have despised me. Can you imagine the man after God's own heart being told you have despised me? I doubt David was thinking about God at all when he took Uriah's wife. But that's the problem. He didn't consider God. He didn't cling to God. Instead, he sinned and this is how God reckons it. You despised my word and you despised me. This is sobering for us all. Continuing verse 11, thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. So in this rebuke, God first tells David what he's done for him. Then he tells David what David has done. Then God says what he will do. The sword will never depart from David's house. Sin has consequences. Verse 13, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, 
the Lord also has taken away your sin, you shall not die. God had already been moving in David's heart to bring him to repentance. In Psalm 32 verses 3 and 4, David describes what that was like. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. God's grace and mercy. He was disturbing David, taking away his peace and strength so David would know he was not in a good place spiritually. This moment with Nathan brings it to a head and David confesses that he has sinned. And look at the grace of God. The Lord has taken away your sin. You shall not die. David's sins were punishable by death under the law of Moses. The Lord is more merciful than David. David said the man in the story deserved to die. God says, you will live. And we read this and praise God because Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death. We all deserve to die. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ paid the penalty for our sins on the cross. As believers in Christ, we know the gratitude that had to have been in David's heart at that moment. But verse 14, however, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, this child also that is born to you shall surely die. David would not die for his sin, but the sin had to be judged nonetheless. Continuing verse 15, so Nathan went to his house. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David, so that he was very sick. David therefore inquired of God for the child. And David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. David knows that God has said the child will die, but he's still seeking the Lord, thinking perhaps God may show mercy and spare the child. Continuing verse 18, then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to our voice. How then can we tell him that the child is dead, since he might do himself harm? But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house. And when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. So although judgment comes to pass, as God says, and the child is dead, David goes into the house of the Lord and worships. His heart and mind are lifted to God once more. Continuing verse 21, Then his servants said to him, What is this thing that you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? 
I will go to him, but he will not return to me. David will see his baby one day in glory. He has that beautiful assurance. Continuing verse 24, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her. And she gave birth to a son and he named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved him and sent word through Nathan the prophet and he named him Jedidiah for the Lord's sake. Jedidiah means beloved of the Lord. Again, what grace the Lord shows. He could have shunned any offspring of this union given its sinful origin, but God loves this child. This will even be the child who takes the throne after David. Continuing verse 26, now Joab fought against Rabbah of the sons of Ammon and captured the royal city. Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah. I have even captured the city of waters. Now, therefore, gather the rest of the people together and camp against the city and capture it, or I will capture the city myself, and it will be named after me. So David gathered all the people and went to Rabbah, fought against it, and captured it. Then he took the crown of their king from his head, and its weight was a talent of gold, and in it was a precious stone and it was placed on David's head, and he brought out the spoil of the city in great amounts. He also brought out the people who were in it and set them under saws, sharp iron instruments and iron axes, and made them pass through the Brickland. And thus he did to all the cities of the sons of Ammon. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. So it's back to the battle that began in chapter 10. David is a warrior once again, leading his nation to victory. So much in this chapter and the last one for us to take heed of and to ponder. David was a man who had a close relationship with God. He knew how to cling to God. He wasn't looking to sin. But when temptation came, he fell. We read this soberly because 1 Corinthians 10, 12 tells us, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. But as much as these chapters are about David and his sins, they are even more so about God. We should take note of how God views sin that he views it as against him. Imagine him saying to you or me, I sent my son for you. I delivered you. I anointed you by my spirit. I blessed you with every spiritual blessing. If that were not enough, I would have added to it. Why have you despised my word and despised me? by doing this thing. I pray we remember the words that God said to David. I pray they check us and deter us when we are tempted to sin. And I also pray that we remember God's mercy and grace. He didn't cast David from his presence. He did not sever the relationship. David had grace to cling to God once more. Oh, to remember that. Back to Psalm 32, and you should read Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, both written by David in conjunction with his sin with Bathsheba. David said in Psalm 32, five through seven, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. 
You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I pray we take seriously sin and its consequences. And I pray we hold fast to the truth that God is gracious to forgive. The God who is our hiding place, who surrounds us with songs of deliverance.